Great. Uh, with that, I'll kind of get into the best practices now. Uh, and again, the best practices are hopefully going to be re a reiteration of some of the, the, the principles and concepts that we talked about earlier. Uh, before we get really into it, I do want to say that one of the best things you can do is, is be proactive. So time now saves a whole lot of time later on. Investing time in planning and problem solving now is going to save a lot of time down the road. Spending the, the two hours that it might take to unbox a GNSS receiver, plug the antenna in, put the SIM card in it, get it powered on, get it online, play with it and test it in the office before you go set it up in the field is going to save you a whole lot of time. Uh, installing the software before things need to happen, uh, getting your orders in early, uh, practicing with the equipment, asking questions and just being ahead of the curve is really going to save a whole lot of time because as soon as you go and install these projects in the field, any little delay turns into a much larger issue. Um, great. So with that, I'll also get into uh, choosing the right equipment. So when it comes to specking your receivers and antennas, uh, the world of GNSS is vast and wide. There's a lot of manufacturers. There's a lot of models. There's a lot of tracking and accuracy differences, storage, the um, uh, data interval or tracking frequency intervals and things like that. So you really want to understand the accuracy and thresholds and tracking requirements and storage requirements that you need before that project starts. And then choose an instrument that either meets or exceeds the accuracy and data tracking requirements. That way you're not pushing the limit of it. So if you need a, you know, a centimeter or two centimeter level of, of accuracy, you can spec in something that can track one centimeter or sub centimeter level to track all the constellations, all these different kinds of things. Um, for monitoring, we do have a very specific version of the R750. So the R750 is the newest uh, geospatial receiver from Trimble. It's a modular receiver. So it's really designed to do a lot of things. It's, it's designed to be used as a base station for those base and rover setups. Uh, it's designed to be used to some extent as a core station or like a permanently operating base station. Uh, and we have a monitoring variant of that receiver. So the advantage of the monitoring variant is that it is a fully loaded receiver. It does all of your uh, constellation tracking. So it does everything that's in the sky. It does GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Baidu, all the, all the big ones. Um, and it can track up to 50 Hertz and has a lot of onboard storage. So it's fully loaded, um, but because it's for monitoring, we lock it to T4D. So it can't be used as that base and rover setup. It can't send corrections out. All it's doing is, is recording that position and transmitting it to T4D. And then you get all the advantages of T4D, which is the reporting, the alarming, the processing, the analyses. Uh, we have a lot of resources on T4D and, and all the visualization and alarming and reporting features that you get. Uh, you can always follow up on the monitoring uh, YouTube channel, the monitoring website. There's a lot of resources on it. Or if you have questions, just feel free to reach out anytime and we can we can answer them kind of uh, in person or, or on a call or email, whatever it might be. Uh, but just know that the R750 is the premier receiver for monitoring. It's fully loaded, so you get all the precise tracking, uh, but it is more budget friendly because it's locked to T4D, so it's kind of single application. When we're talking about field practice or best practices for the field setup, um, again, we want to determine the location and that zone of influence and, and the position of the stations before everything starts. We never want to get out to the site and then try to figure it out for the first time when we see stuff. So it's always worth doing a site visit, getting satellite imagery, kind of determining these zones and positions uh, as soon as you can. One of the, the most important things as well is the location of the base stations. The base stations need to be reliable, so they need constant power and communication. Uh, they need to be in stable positions because any unwanted movement in your base station is going to transmit uh, or propagate movement into your monitoring station, and it's going to look like movement data. And it can be really difficult to troubleshoot a moving base station. So really making sure that these are, are stable and installed before anything else goes up is really important. It's also really important to determine the location of your stations prior to the project start. Uh, positioning stations and determining coordinates is kind of a, an art all on its own. Uh, we have a whole team, so the RTN and corrections team is really good at determining these station locations and processing uh, data and tracking things before everything gets started, especially in like a base station or cores or network application. Uh, generally, we recommend that that stations be installed for two weeks at least before the project starts. The reason being that the, the GNSS satellites are moving all over the place. It takes about two weeks to go through a full orbit cycle and track every satellite that's available. And when we're processing locations, we want to make sure that we're tracking information from each satellite before we commit that location. So we always recommend at least two weeks worth of data before you process that location and, and committed as kind of that starting position. When it comes to automation as well, so one of the most important things with monitoring is getting reliable automated equipment. The biggest piece of that is power and communication. So making sure that the instrument is powered up and sending that data somewhere consistently. We really wanna make sure that there's power and network available before we start the monitoring project. It can be extremely difficult to run power and network if you need to do it at the last minute. Something that we're seeing more often, especially as technology evolves and we kind of adopt more, more um, kind of available kits, 
uh, is that we're doing more solar and cellular setups. So the R750 has a built-in cellular modem. It can take a 4G SIM card, you just put it in and it's online. Super easy config. We also have a solar kit available through one of our partners. Uh, so if you need to set up a monitoring station or a base station location, and there's not always power and network available, it's really easy to spec in a, a solar kit and a SIM card, get it online and get it powered. Solar kits are becoming extremely reliable. The ones that we spec are overbuilt on purpose. That way there's plenty of, of power backup and reliability built into it. It has really quality components and they've been reliable so far. So we're, we're proud to kind of have these on board. Um, housings and enclosures is another really important piece of the automation because you're going to be leaving these pieces of equipment out in the field 24-7. Uh, the antennas are built to be outside because they need to be outside to track all the, the satellites. Uh, but the receivers are a little bit more sensitive. So we always want to add something like a housing to make sure we're protecting it from weather, theft, vandalism, all the different kinds of things that can happen to equipment when it's on site. Another really important piece of automation is that data management side. So making sure that we not only have something as simple as the SIM card with enough data on it and it's always paid for, that way it doesn't take the whole project offline. I've seen a lot of projects go down because the SIM card isn't getting paid for, somebody forgets to pay the bill, communication goes offline, all the, all the stations come down and all of a sudden the monitoring project stops. So you wanna make sure you, you keep track of things like that. Also making sure that you have a server that has enough storage space, uh, enough network connection, the data is coming in and being processed correctly. You're determining your sampling rate and your processing intervals, your report schedule, your alarm frequency, all these different kinds of things that go into managing the system. You wanna make sure you set those up correctly, make sure that they're managed properly. You're not overwhelming the system. You're, you're meeting your requirements, but not overloading everybody with information. It can be a, a balancing act. So really making sure that you determine the requirements before you start and then kind of specking your system accordingly. Uh, it's also worth, worth mentioning baselines. So again, establishing positions for all your stations as soon as possible. This lets you do a lot of things. Uh, one is it buys you ample time to, again, track all the satellites and get a good uh, starting coordinate for all of your stations, so tracking two weeks worth of data. But it also lets you understand that structural variation, the natural variation in whatever you're measuring, because everything is going to move uh, due to some outside forces, whether it's going to be the weather, the temperature, the tides, the, the wind, the season, everything is going to make changes um, no matter what you're measuring. So measuring early and understanding how things behave is going to be really important to uh, explaining the data and understanding how things move from outside influences. The other thing that starting early lets you do is, is it just buys you time in case there's some changes that need to be made. With every project, you can plan as much as you want, but when you get on site, there's always something that changes. And so having the ability to react to it and adapt to those changes and, and make and implement uh, in real time without having to do it um, kind of when the pressure is on can be a, a big time saver. It can save the project. It can save a lot of time, a lot of hassle, a lot of, of stress. And so starting early is going to make it a lot easier to react to things when you change them. Um, it's also important to note that that it's always going to be worth practicing with your equipment before you, before you install it in the field. It can be as easy as, again, plugging in your receiver, putting the SIM card in it, transmitting data over to T40 and making sure that connection is live. That way, when you go to the field, you can just plug it in and call it good. Because a lot of times we're installing this equipment in remote areas with hard to access places, maybe we're up on a ladder, or up on a lift, and it can be really annoying. So if you're installing for the first time, it's gonna be important to learn this equipment before you go in the field. And then when you do install it in the field, it's not the first time you've looked at it. So it's gonna be uh, much easier to, to get through. Uh, most importantly, uh, all of the best practices for monitoring follow the same principles as just general surveying and use with GNSS. Uh, all the way from the error corrections to the station setup to, to making sure you track enough satellites and your, your multipath is good. Everything just follows the basic principles of measuring with GNSS. The only difference is that we're measuring the same set of points through time and usually we're automating these GNSS uh, stations. So always remember when you're monitoring, just use good principles and follow basic techniques and best practices, and then you're going to be set up for success with your monitoring project.